Welcome to the Comarc Weekly Podcast Series, a space to share and explore the latest thinking in architecture, building science, materials, and design. Before we begin, please remember to subscribe to one or all of our channels, YouTube, all major podcast platforms, and of course, the Comarc website. In this episode, Comarc has a dialogue with Dr. Leo Mazzo, Curator of American Arts at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, to discuss the work of Edward Hopper in the context of a VMFA Hopper exhibition. Areas covered include an overview of the history of Edward Hopper's works with a focus on their intersection with hotels, exploring and outlining core philosophical concepts of place and space, and the complex interplay of art, history, and culture. Dr. Leo Mazzo, Louise B. and J. Harwood Cochran, Curator of American Arts, has been at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts since 2016. A specialist in 19th and 20th century American painting and cultural history, he received his PhD at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. From 2010 through 2016, he was an associate professor of art history at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. From 2002 to 2010, he was curator of American arts at the Palmer Museum of Art at Penn State University. Thank you for joining us this week. Let's hop into the podcast. So curating this exhibit, fascinating. It is, it's been a lot of fun. So as an architect walking through, it's very interesting to see the relationship between the physical human and the physical space yeah. and what's going on. Can you talk a little bit about that? I can, uh, and the re I think it's easy to talk about that because I think it's something that Popper very much thought about. He thinks about figure-ground relationships. He, but to be more specific, Popper is very interested in how people at once engage and disengage from their architectural settings. Art historians often use the word interiority to talk about the personality, the relationship of the built environment uh, to those people enclosed in the environment. This is something that Popper thought about a lot. So um, I think. In what language besides the visual would he would he describe it? You know, in what language? Well, I, I think that. I think that Hopper, you know, he is an artist, he's, in many, he's a commercial, he, he gets his start for over two decades, he's a commercial illustrator, and he never loses the vocabulary of commercial illustration, and although there was a time in his life where it was in his, it was to his benefit to um, talk down somewhat, play down his role as an illustrator, um, it's very clear that he never leaves behind and in fact remains comfortable with the commercial setting. Remember, the, in the most obvious sense, many of the spaces you're looking at are commercial properties in the first place. These are hotels, motels, tourist homes, so like Airbnbs. There are motor courts, motor camps, and apartment hotels. Our hotel apartments pay a lease for, for them, but they have the amenities of a hotel. He understands how these work, how these work, because among the many trade magazines, commercial periodicals he illustrated for, were two of the best known trade publications, hotel trade publications of the day. First was a magazine called Tavern Topics, published in the label Tavern Topics. We love the alliteration. Tavern Topics, he did illustrations for it, published by the Waldorf Astoria Corporation. And it was distributed in the many properties that they own, such as the McAlpine, and the Annex, and of course the Waldorf Astoria itself, and many others. He did five covers and several line drawings and interior works for them. From 1924 to 1925, Edward Hopper produced 18 uh, full color, brilliant, prismatic, engaging covers for hotel management, which is still very much in operation to this day. It's owned by the Questex Media Group. Um, and, uh, and the reason why there are so many of these in the publication at Forever Hopper and the American Hotel and this, uh, the exhibition itself is because they provided a storehouse of images and ideas to which Hopper would defer in his many hospitality services, things, uh, hotels, restaurants and hotels, things like that. But even works that had nothing to do with 
hotel or restaurant management. So he spoke the language of commercial illustration throughout his life, but it's also something that he also spoke the language of the, um, he had the vantage point and the vocabulary as a tourist. Uh, he had the tourist's gaze. He stayed in hotels and when others were paying the bills, certainly, but he took many, when he's on the road for many months out of any given year, and he stays in motels and motor ports and port So do you think that the publication and that experience informed him to be more critical in his, his view of a hotel as well and see nuances others would have? I would say critical in the sense of seeing nuances, not necessarily critical in the critique, let me make value judgment sense. I think he has a certain visual acuity. I think that he paints and limbs his drawings with a degree of architectural precision seen in the works of some, but not too many other contemporaries, to be sure. And a, nice, a niche that not many were able to, to hit. You know, there are others who have their mo moments. Charles Birchfield, uh, Reginald Marsh, George O'Keefe, to be sure. However, I think that architecture is always foregrounded in both literal and a metaphorical sense. With so let's talk about space and place. Yeah. Well, so um, without getting too jargony, as we were discussing earlier, the cultural geographer, um, at University of Wisconsin for many years, E. Thutuan, uh, in some of his volumes, made a distinction between space and place um, that I think is helpful for understanding a lot of the, the paintings we see in this show and, 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 and the works of many artists and authors who, who take us through built landscapes. Uh, in Tuan's estimation, a place and a space are two different things. A space is a physical entity, to be sure. Uh, it's often something you go through, but it's something that one does not necessarily have an intimate uh, engagement with. The intimate engagement that he thinks about is pause. He writes if, if uh, Space is motion, place is pause. What does he mean by this? Well, there's certain things that because of how visually beguiling they are, and because of our relationships, our human relationships to those things, we, maybe there's a historical memory, oh, maybe Washington Cross for Galloway. Um, this is Ellis Island. This is where your great, great grandparents came to the United States. Or, this is the San Andreas Fault Line. Let us stop and look at this. Um, so because of things in the natural landscape or that we bring, baggage we bring, that they get us to literally pause. And so we bring an understanding to it and it becomes a place. Now, the, for Hopper, and I don't think Hopper would have ever put it in these words, to put it mildly, he'd probably find this, this whole conversation unnecessarily pedantic, I feel sure of that, but I do think that he draws a distinction and he in fact blurs the definitions of both of these perhaps obvious uh, sensibilities. Because in Hopper's work, and the work of others, um, uh, including poets and authors like Sinclair Lewis, and Willa Catha, and John Dos Passos, poets and writers, we see our share in Hemingway in, in A Farewell to Arms. Much of A Farewell to Arms takes place in hotels. Frederick and Catherine, in Hemingway's Farewell to Arms, they are in hotels a lot. But in Hopper, we see a lot of transportation. We see marine craft, we see automotives, cars, we see, uh, we see trains. But we also see roads, things that get us there. We see motels and hotels and diners. We see the places that give us a breath that allow us to come up for air as we go through the American spaces. And the beauty and the genius of Hopper's hotels, motels, apartments, and apartments hotels is that he reminds us that there are places for pause 
these in-between moments called hotels and motels in a landscape full of motion and transience and rushing from one place to another. Does that make sense? It makes total sense. But And there's a psychological force in all this as well. Oh, absolutely. So, would you talk well, about that? I think, I think Hopper uh, understands psychology both in that, you know, he comes of age during the flowering of popular psychology. Um, I don't think he has a superficial, by any means, understanding of psychology, but I do think that there was a time when saying things like, oh, how Freudian of you, or how Jungian of you, you know, in T.S. Eliot's grand poem, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, the work is not, that poem is not about art history, but we're told, in the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. Now, is this, would it be missing the point to think of Michelangelo's David or Pieta when you read T.S. Eliot? Maybe, but that's a good example of how art history entered our vernacular lexicon and was popularized. In a similar way, Jung and Freud and Lacan eventually all become part of our colloquial. I think Hopper understands that. And Hopper, in selected works, absolutely with his figures of individuals sitting on the edge of a bed, not knowing quite what they've done, the world they've created for themselves, and here they are enclosed in an apartment, a resort room, a hotel. What exactly has transpired? In many ways, Hopper does a very good job of responding to the visual culture of popular psychology. In his paintings, what is he referencing in popular psychology? Because that, there's a tension always. Popular psychology and professional clinical psychology are quite different beasts. I think he is more, is better read than the person at a cocktail party saying, oh, how Freudian, or let me talk of Mi Michelangelo. You know, in, in Eliot's poem, which I know you know, um, these are people who measure out their world in terms of keystones and hopes and ices. Hopper is pretty well read, to say the least. Um, and. You know, there's a painting, one of the more famous paintings in the exhibition here at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, is called Excursion into Philosophy. And in her notes, uh, in the ledger book that Edward and his artist wife, Josephine, kept, Joe writes, that's her nickname, Joe writes, so there's, a, there's an open book, of the book, you can show this uh, in the podcast or online. There's an open book next, next to the bottomless woman. Uh, and Joe writes, the book is open to Plato, perhaps read too late. Now on the one hand, that's kind of funny and it opens some speculation, like what could that mean? On the other hand, these are people who probably knew Plato's Republic and Plato's allegory of the cave. These are people who had a more than ordinary understanding of philosophy. These are individuals who came of age in, in you know, they understood what anxiety was. And the anxiety that they often register is the understanding of place. You do are wealthy is right. There's a sense of place. Place becomes a plot determinant in a lot of literature. But I think that wealthy and Yifu Tuan laid a groundwork upon which we can be even more specific and talk about the psychology of place. And I'm sure many have, in fact, in fact, written about this. The psychology of place has to do with how comfortable you are or are not with your surroundings. How do you respond to it? And as you go through the oeuvre of Edward Hopper, you see people in varying degrees of detachment from their place. Um, they're not sure whether they're in a, a drive-by space or they're in the permanence, the place that merits pause. Perfect. There you go. So, what are you reading? What's exciting you right now? What's exciting me? Reading? Well, I mean, I think 
I think commercial architecture is what we're all reading. <laughs> of course. Uh, but what I'm reading these days is um, I recently read the uh, an autobiography, a me memoir by Jeff Tweedy. Jeff Tweedy, the lead singer for Wilco. Um, I'm also very interested in Sinclair Lewis. Uh, he has a novel called Work of Art, which is about an individual who has a rough time reconciling himself to the fact that he's spent most of his world obsessed with hotels. Sinclair Lewis is better known for Babbitt and Main Street, things like that. From a big Sinclair Lewis fan, um, I haven't made my uh, way uh, entirely through Donna Clark's book, The Goldfinch, I think, yeah. um, which is apparently being made into a movie, so perhaps I don't. Um, what are you reading these days? You know, it's interesting. I want to get back into reading. I used to read two books a week, one fiction, one nonfiction. That's who I was. That right. was my brand. And over this time of internet and everything else, it's been right. a struggle. You, you read something um, like on Kindle, yeah. And then the next thing you know, you're shopping for shoes on Amazon. Right. So that attention span. The, th the best book I've read that captivated me was um, Patti Smith's books. On kids? Just, yeah. Just, just, kids. just beautifully yeah. written. You know, a lot of those Maple uh I think, are hotels and motels, too. And a lot of... Um, yeah. Um, she's an, an interesting person. Patti Smith is... Uh, did you know the musician Richard Hell? Of course, yeah. Yeah. Um, there are a moment that I fear that my son will not get, and I fear that others will not understand. It's, it's CBGB's, it's Studio 54, but it's also, you know, it's also um, homophobia. Uh, it's also racism. It's also uh, a New York City, a Times Square, that looks so different than what it does now. And I worry it's Disney that I, I wonder, you know, if um, Popper and uh, John Updike and Upton Sinclair and Elvis Presley are the primary sources of Popper's mid-century modern world. What are the primary sources of light here and now? Um, and um, I think that. I think that the punk world of the Ramones and CBGBs is not that different from the world of David Boyne and Boynerovich, Marina Abramovich. Um, and, uh, you know, I... So you see some matches? I absolutely do. And, you know, I, I you, really like the sneaker culture that's going on. Yeah. The hip-hop, the NBA I do, obsession. I do, I do too, but have you been to many sneaker shops? Some. There's a fantastic one in New, New York, Los Angeles, and right here, called Round Two. I, I'm gonna check it out. It's a, Jane, have you been to Round Two on Broad? It's literally across the street from the court. I only know this. It's on a Black Friday morning, much colder than this. I sat, I camped outside with my son. It was awful. You know, because oh, he wanted special sneakers that were coming in. No, he just they had they had deals. And oh. it, it's its own culture and. Um, Anyway, I... Well, like their websites where you can actually, you know it's genuine and there's trading going on. Yeah, and there are a lot of fakes, but a lot of websites, you know, um, sneaker culture, which I did not, if my son were to hear me refer to him as a sneaker head, I would be reprimanded. You know, he would say, Dad, you're not in that pay grade. And, you know, and by, by the way, you know what, you know what the king of sneaker culture rem remains? Yeezys. Brilliant. And Yeezys, you know who Yeezys are the brainchild of? Kanye West. And so I have to tell you that um, used Yeezys cost a lot more than new ones. Right? And it's just, it's what it's, you know, it's, um, it's interesting. But I would like to steer the conversation back to a little bit about hospitality services and what we are and are not com comfortable with. And um, it's my hope that people will come to the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts between now and February 23rd. It's also my hope that people will see the second incarnation of this project from June 7th to September 13th at the Indianapolis Museum of Art at Newfields. 
I mean, one of the things that the, the exhibition argues is that a hotel is a lot like a painting. And that's such a weird thing to say, but I want to, but before solving that equation, maybe that's a good note on which to conclude this. I want people to come here and see the ways in which, although he would not in a million years have set a clock like that, but Hopper makes a very strong case for a hotel being a lot like that. Fantastic. It yeah. is a fantastic exhibit. Well, thank you so much. Thank, thank you for doing this. Awesome. The Comarch team thanks you as always for joining us for this week's podcast. Please remember to subscribe to the Comarch YouTube channel, follow us on your favorite podcast platform, and take advantage of the Comarch website, where you can access all these platforms and associated podcast transcripts. Until next time.